I'm Puerto Rican. I'm pretty sure that I'll talk loudly <laughs> as the time goes on. Um, so thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, before I begin, I have a CEO who was very clear that I had to make sure I talked about the mentoring partnership in New York and Long Island before I started. <laughs> and as the ops person with an aggressive uh, vision for the next three years, I'm happy to share that with you. But the mentoring partnership in New York and Long Island has been in existence now for over 20 years. Right now we serve over 400 programs that serve over 57,000 children across New York City. Essentially, we are the place that helps on the ground to make sure that children get the services they need from their mentors and from their programs. As you know, one of the things we're trying to eradicate is the dropout rate in New York City and Long Island. And so we believe that one of the first things that an individual, a young person needs is someone to help guide and foster the curiosity, the passions, and sort of the skills that they have within them to the next level. And I'm sure you would imagine that there's somebody who's been in your life as a mentor who's done the same for you. So in order to do that, there is some complexity, however. There is the informal things that happen in a mentoring relationship and then the very formal things that need to happen for us to make sure that there's impact. So it's not rocket science, but if you put all the right elements together, it can actually reverse some of the things we find hinder young people and professionals from being able to be successful. So I'm sure that you have a wealth of experience. I'm not here to teach you anything. I'm here to allow you to do two things today. Be present in the moment to make sure that you're sure about what you know for sure. <laughs> And then to leverage that so that this young person at the end of the six month experience not only has a dynamic relationship with you, but also will look back and say, you know, it was that person that really put me on the yellow brick road, right? And so believe it or not, there's some intentionality in making that happen. So we do this every day at every level. I think one of the greatest gifts that I have is to be able to talk to the executive on the ground trying to eradicate the issues in the community and the mentors who have stepped up to do the most amazing thing that you could ever do, give of your time and of yourself to make a difference. And so we do this every day. And it's sort of fun. So the idea here is that you have a little bit of fun that I loosen you up to get you ready for your mentees. <laughs> Um, so that you can start to really foster a healthy relationship over the next six months. The other hope is, as we're guiding the chamber through this process, in the six months completion, what we would like to see happen is that you've actually had impact and that there's measurable outcomes. And so part of my job is in the back end of this to be able to help them guide all of you to be able to measure that and give forth what it is that we truly have accomplished in six months. So it's very intentional, because the only way you're gonna take this to scale is if you do it right at the micro level, so that we could do it right in the scale. Okay, fair enough? That is enough from me. This is an all participatory session, because I am not the expert, you are. <laughs> so let's start with the basics. Let's think about who was your first mentor in your first job, and tell me why you thought that person was a great mentor. What did they have? Sorry, I know I'm not supposed to move, but I gotta get a marker. <laughs> this is an open book test. Please feel free to cheat. <laughs> they had a genuine interest. The other thing I will caution is that I have non-teacher penmanship and there is no spell check. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Patience. Patience. Perspective. Excuse me? Perspective. Perspective. Come on, you guys. You got successful by yourself. Please give me that formula. Guidance. <laughs> guidance. What type of guidance? 
one person starting out and still trying to figure out what is it that you want to do, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, mm -hmm. uh, through this whole self-analysis of what your next step is in your career. I love that, self-analysis. I think you're challenging as well. My, the one I'm thinking of is very challenging. Challenging in the sense that you never wanted to call him back or her back? <laughs> no, in terms of challenging everyone that you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So you're challenging them towards success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got you. Insightful. 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 Tell me a little bit about that. And that's so important because I can't see for myself what's available to me quite yet. You don't yet. know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know, absolutely. Anything else? I think you had, uh, you know, a certain sensitivity in the sense that they, they put themselves in their shoes. Yeah. Uh, remembering that, you know, how they went through the process themselves. Yeah. So. Key, important. Anybody else? Say it now, forever hold your peace. <laughs> Say that again. Willingness to share their experiences. Yes. What type of experiences? There are. Uh huh. All good? Uh, we're bad. Uh So, I don't want to listen to you. I don't listen to my parents, <laughs> even though they're giving me sound advice. How do you make that happen? Well, yeah, I think that you know when, when you are the mentor. You don't have an incentive to tell the guy things that he doesn't want to, to, to listen, you know? Mm -hmm. So you need to be, be brave enough to say, mm -hmm. look, I, I'm gonna do this. I know, I know that it's gonna be disruptive. Mm -hmm. I know that you are, gonna, I, you are not gonna like it, but this is the way to improve, you know? Mm -hmm. And you need to be brave to, to, to this confrontational. It's, you know, nobody likes that, particularly in certain cultures. Yeah. It's almost like brave feedback and criticism, right? Yeah. You have to have the strength to do it, and you have to have the tact to deliver it, right? I think there's a difference, I mean, with, a, with parents and, and with a, a mentor, because you normally say, well, your parents' experience doesn't really apply to me. Right. Because I'm different, I'm a new generation, whereas mm -hmm. a mentor, you know, something you look up uh, to, mm -hmm. because uh, you have more more respect for a mentor, or, you know, someone who's within professional field and you admire. So there's a sense of admiration in a mentor, or a concept of a, or element of admiration that that it makes it makes difference with a thing compared to with your parent. Yeah. And I would say that when you look at the research, and there's tons of folks who have done research, we are completely research based in the mentoring space. Our national organization actually makes sure that every outcome we have has an, a correlated action that's research based. So one of the things that we realize, regardless of age of the mentee, is that your vulnerability, the sensitivity, your ability to know how to deliver criticism and feedback, right? These things are more of the things that you need to make sure you have stored in your own back pocket. These are the things that you have to be exhibiting at all time, at all times. And one of the things that they found is that admiration is something that's earned. So although we think, well, if I want to become CEO of the company, and I'm talking to CEO of the company, <laughs> that would naturally equal to a healthy, some type of interactive mentoring relationship. And a lot of times what happens is that the level of intimidation from the mentee's perspective and their inability to see themselves completely in that path and trajectory actually helps trump 
all the other things that have to happen in a mentoring relationship. So what I will say to you is that you're going to get this. In six months, you, you already have it. It will be the thing that's in your way for now. And in six months, it will be the thing that will say, this is why I am who I am, right? So you're going to have to navigate this piece in order for these pieces to get you to where you want with the young person, OK? So one of the things that I think is critically important, even in the feedback piece, is making sure that your expectations of that relationship is realistic, right? Because you're not, even if you see their potential, you're, you're not, not going to make them the next great right, CEO, even though no, if you see it, right? right? And it's, it's not, not going to happen, happen right away. away. Or you're not going to see in the six months the outcome that you expect for them. They have to sort of get there. So one of the things you have to figure out in this process, which is critical, is how you're going to negotiate those goals and expectations as you go along. But the most important component of the mentoring relationship, I will tell you it's the hardest thing about this job, from your perspective, is you. <laughs> and how you calibrate the perception of your mentee and how you decide to do kind of these soft skills that I know you all do very, very well, but almost do them intentionally all the time, right? And so that will determine your success. Not rocket science, right? Pretty simple, but you gotta practice it. Not so simple. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, I'm gonna move you along, because I know we started with, so. I'm sorry, I'm a technology person, and I only use my notebook for the time. Uh, so one of the things that I really think is important is when you define that mentor-protege relationship, I think one of the things that you first have to think about is you're developing a relationship. Get to know the person that you're talking to. You want to know what's really happening at work? They have to have some type of connection to you. So one of the things I was talking to Sandra and Gemma about is, oh, they have their bios. That's great. If I am 19, 20, 21 years old, and I saw all of your bios, and they said they're pairing you up with that person, how would you feel at that juncture of your life, right? There is excitement, but there is sort of this intimidation. And so making sure that in the process you become real first. This is what tonight's about. You have to be who you are. The authenticity is what will define the relationship. And then from that, you sort of figure out all the other pieces. But the development of the professional aspect of that individual's career will not come without the intimacy of the connection of the relationship. So I'll give you an example. Research has shown what goes sour in the chemistry of a mentor and a mentee that they weren't able to match them according to likability. So this is the one place where opposites will not attract, right? And so when you're trying to figure out why isn't this relationship meshing, I will promise you it's because there's no common ground. So one of the first things that you have to do in this relationship is find the common ground. And what we're hoping we're doing in the next 40 minutes, more for them than for you, is getting them ready to sort of gear up what do I want this person to know about me so that we can find that common ground and then be able to lift from there? It's not hard, but if you don't do it, it will fall apart pretty easily, right? Impact. A relationship that lasts six months is really important. That's the marker of where impact begins in a mentoring relationship. A year, you'll stay together forever. Together, quotation marks, right? So what does that look like in those six months? Dosage and frequency, right? So for example, when I think of my mentor, who's very busy, and she has a full-blown schedule, and I feel very embarrassed sometimes to say, can I have 15 minutes of your time? Because I know it's like 15 minutes for her is big. But every Monday, you know, for the last couple of years, <laughs> it's always been a date. At a certain time, we have a phone call. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, doesn't matter where she is in the world, doesn't matter what she's doing, those are my 10, 15 minutes. Because I anticipate that phone call sometimes, I will analyze a certain situation and, then, and know that I can't knee-jerk react because I probably want to pass it by her, right? And so, and we've been friends forever. <laughs> 
But for a young person, knowing that they have some type of consistency will help them be able to rely on your relationship for the guidance and support that you truly want to give them, right? So you can be that intentional with the dosage. If you're free-flowing, people become less committed, most especially in the beginning. After the next six months, it's easier to free flow it. The first six months, I would say, be intentional. Try to make it every other week. Make that sliver of time for that person and put some rules of engagement of what happens if I wanna talk to you outside of that time, right? Things do happen. I would love your feedback. It's hot off the press. But you also don't want them to call you when it's hot off the press in their head. You want them to process situations a little bit. And so make sure you lay some you know, groundwork around what that looks like. We have a standing meeting. There are times you can get on my calendar. Here are some reasons why I would love you to be on my calendar so that they have some parameters. But at a minimum, twice a month, go all in. Be present, okay? It's gonna be that consistency that then will allow the vulnerability you want from the mentee towards you to say, you know, I went to work this morning and I did this. <laughs> and then your reaction will elicit exactly how I'm gonna proceed the next time when I decide to share something with you that I may have thought was good or bad for that matter, okay? So timing, dosage, how you commit, how you're communicating is going to be critical um, in this process. So, and I think you have to be very intentional with that, okay? The number one thing when you look at even medical schools, for example, that are trying to mentor um, a very specific type of learning, whether it's research, neurology, something that there is no, hardly any other person in the world that could teach me that. The ones that were most successful the feedback they got from their mentee wasn't, oh my God, I learned so many brilliant things from this amazing person and da 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 It was that they were present, that they were consistent, that they got great feedback, and that they had understood who they were as an individual, and that allowed them to understand the work better. And so all those things are so not about the content of the work, right? Um, so we have to make sure that you have some of those pieces in place. Can I talk any faster? I will uh, test it now. Um, we talked a little bit about the intimidation factor. I think that it's going to take a while to sort of break that down a little bit. I think that people are very courageous. I think that they will react a certain way. And I think young people by and far are very confident and will put all those walls of confidence up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're truly sharing their experiences with you. So you have to make sure that over time there are things that happen that really get you into those important conversations that you need to have, okay? So one of the exercises that I want you to do, because I know, that this is always difficult for me to do. So I'm gonna put it out there. I'm gonna pair you up and you're gonna do a listening exercise. So here's your challenge. Um, are we even here? No. Good, Anna. You'll be somebody's partner. Fabulous. This is my mentee, my intern mentee for the next four months. So if I haven't done a good job, she'll let you know at the end of the session. <laughs> um, so here's what we're gonna do. One of you is gonna be the talker. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Anna's your partner. Okay. Number one, you're the talker for one entire minute. A challenge or a problem you've had this week, this month, explain the scenario to the person for one entire minute. Listener, you do not get to talk, ask questions, you must listen and acknowledge. Maybe an uh-huh. Really? Wow, that happened. <laughs> Please don't use that cadence. They will not believe you're listening. <laughs> but somewhere along those lines, okay? Then you're going to switch positions. Remember how you're feeling in both of those ends, and then we'll talk about what that means to everybody else. You ready? Find a pair. We did one, two, one, two. All right. So one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and you're with Anna. Go for I'm it. I love it. 
environment is tight and significant. Yeah. Yeah. The regulatory environment is tight and significant. Yeah. And yeah. so the revenue is all right, let's talk about your experience when you are the talker for a minute. What was that like? To be the one that had to talk. So we would stay focused. You had to stay focused. How hard to do? How hard is that to do? The whole minute. The whole minute, yeah. The whole one minute thing is a big deal. It feels long. It feels long, right? Okay. What else? When you were the talker. You're concerned if the other person thinks it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Yes. yes. <laughs> so it was not interesting. Yes, you were. <laughs> 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 That's what you. Affirmation <laughs> is important, right? What else is going on when you're the talker? You feel relieved. <laughs> you feel relieved, yes. <laughs> well, you want to make sure that you're not going off on some tangent. Sometimes yeah, you get passionate yes. about something and the you might not have a common theme when running <laughs> yeah. through what you have to say. The famous tangent. I love right. that. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's not what I really wanted to tell that person, right? <laughs> what else? You're hoping you're being relevant and you're not going into too much detail or that you're at the right okay. level. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. And this is um, friendly feedback in this room. Did your listener do a good job? Um, uh-huh, oh yeah, really, that happened to you? Or did they give an opinion, affirmation? Did they do any, ask a question? Mine failed to sleep. <laughs> no, what? no, no, mine fell asleep. You know, yeah. <laughs> I had to wake her up. You had to wake her up. Always. So, talk to me about being the listener. How hard and how easy was that? It's easy. It was easy. For a minute, it's not too hard. For a minute, it's not too hard. Right. <laughs> not so hard. Explain that. Um. Even I can focus for a minute. <laughs> How hard or easy for you was to maintain a level of openness and non-criticism in the process? It's easy. Okay. That wasn't hard. How it's eager were you to wanting to ask questions? Yes, I was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask more. And you had a whole list of yes. them, I'm sure. So one of the things that happens when we're dealing with young people or folks where we're in the position of authority sometimes is the listening part gets kind of intertwined in our forever need to ask the questions. Because many times we're anticipating, most especially if you have experience with certain work-related issues or life issues, your first impulse is to, oh, been there, done that. Here's what you need to do, right? But if you do that, you don't validate this process that this person has to go through. So one of the most important things in that is to try to restrain so they really have given you all the good nuggets of the story the question asking portion of it, right? Because it's in that complete story and that person's being able to deliver it to you in the way in which they've planned in your mind. So imagine all these things that you're feeling, this young person is feeling before they get on the phone with you. Should I really tell them that that happened in my desk yesterday? How do I explain this story? Do I go off on a tangent? I can't tell them why I did that, so I'm gonna say it like this, I'm gonna say it like that. So I've planned, and if you're a process person, you know what I'm talking about. You have planned this conversation in your mind. So you have to figure out how to be able to listen through and then be able to ask some of the critical questions. And the critical questions, here's the big singer, and we would have done this for longer, it would have been a lot more fun, but I'm short for time. So just promise, that, promise you that if you spend a half a day with me, you'll have a lot more fun with me. Um, <laughs> The, the big zinger to the listening process is, are you asking questions that help me or help you? 
Are you asking me things that help me sort of determine and analyze the experience I'm going through? Are you asking me questions because you're trying to figure out the hierarchy of the company so you can navigate? So you're all the way over there, and I'm trying to live right here, my reality, right? And I think that's the hardest part of the listening questioning process. So I would say in your time, be intentional, in completely intentional on how you're going to listen and how you're going to provide sort of that questioning process, most especially in the beginning. Because like everything, you know, if you get your hand slapped, you're not going to do that again to get your hand slapped. So if you elicit unintentionally a reaction that provokes some thought on the mentee's end, it can stymie my ability to the next time come and say, I'm going to be that authentic and honest with them as I go along. So that's the balancing act in this. What I would say is practice this with your significant others, <laughs> with your children, because we think we're doing it, and you start to realize that you're not. So it is truly active listening, and being able to sort of start shaping some of the questions that you're going to ask. And there's a lot of times when I'm working with young people, and Anna has been in my office, and I'm taking notes sometimes, and I'll write a question, and I'll ask myself, is that question for me, or is that question for her? And sometimes what I will tell her is, I'm really curious about this because I've never understood it. Explain it to me. Because then I can feed myself. She knows that I'm curious about her. But I'm not interrupting her need for me to critically ask questions that will help her think about her next logical step. Okay? And so I'm really intentional with that. And I exercise it all the time. You can ask my husband who pulls his hair out. Because <laughs> I will tell him things like, I'm about to ask you this question for me, not for you. So just come along for the ride, all right? So just make sure that you sort of um, endorse that process as you're working with your young people, OK? So one of the things we want to talk about is the initial meeting. So we actually have some handouts for you in your folder. Um, I um, put something. Oh, is here. it the red one or? Yes, the red one. Though. I think Sandra put them out for us. Mm. Oh, the no, like the forms. The no, they're not printed here. Oh, okay. We gave them to the mentees. Okay, so let's walk through what they're working on because I would like for you to know what they're thinking about before you get together. So um, think about a couple of things right now. I don't know if people ask you these things, but to be honest with you, if I ever had the chance to meet someone that I admired and appreciated, I would want to know three things that they like. Three things they don't like. Think about this, because they're thinking about this too. Okay? My favorite thing to do. My proudest moment. So they're thinking about this, so you should be too. Sorry for my chicken scratch. And something I'd like to learn or try in the next year. Okay? So they're thinking about these things. You should think about them too. The basis of your first conversation should be around these things. Okay. So my history high school teacher mastered a way to get hundreds on his test. And it was the style of teaching that provoked for us to have conversations and interactions. He has since gone to my wedding, seen my children born, he's still around. The one thing that always connects us is the NBA Finals. We both love basketball. And so the promise was that I would marry someone who loved the NBA as much as we did, <laughs> so that we could make sure to share that time together. But it's that commonality, and in those exchanges, that I get my most powerful feedback, that I'm most vulnerable to say, you know, this is really what I'm challenged with, and that he continues to mentor me. It's a safe space for the both of us. And over the years, I would tell you that he's probably fessed up some things over a basketball game too, right? 
So this, although seems silly, this is what sort of gets you understanding. If I hate sushi and you decide to take me to lunch for sushi, that's not going to work out for us that day. <laughs> I'll be focused on how to eat what I don't like. You right? have a prediction for game four? <laughs> I have a prediction for game four. four. I think Stephen Curry is going to blow it out the box. <laughs> Stephen, sorry. <laughs> um, but only because LeBron is too tired. You can't score 200 out of the 290 points of three games without letting your body recover, right? I wasn't playing. <laughs> so you see? So just like that, right? So start thinking about this. The other thing that they're thinking about, just so that you know, is things you might want to ask them. Have you ever had a mentor before? What'd you like about that person? Right there, you just cheated. They will tell you that's what you have to do. <laughs> but at least it gives you a good a guideline of when they're evaluating relationships, what are they evaluating, okay? They're thinking about um, what they want to learn from this experience, what they want out of this mentoring relationship. Um, what does success look like for you? So let me ask you guys, what does success look like for you at the end of this six months? You're asking us? What, you I know. am asking you. Okay. What does success look like for you and this young person at the end of six months? Uh, well, I have a previous question, but I thought it was yes. part of Q&A. These are all people who are not, don't have a job right now. Are they looking for a job? Is that the, the situation no. of everyone else? So it's like the ultimate purpose? Like no. So the ultimate Many purpose? Many of them have a job right now. And they are looking maybe to change professionally, or they are looking to grow um, professionally as well, so they are looking for guidance on how to do that. So the banner, so the answer is so there. I mean, right? I mean, if you, if the, those who do not have a job, the uh, success will be measured by having a, a you know, a, the ultimate success at least, right? Having it's them tangible success. It won't be the success of your mentoring relationship. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think if he or she trusts me after six months, that would be a good thing. If they want to continue. If we continue. If they want to continue the relationship. Yeah. Right. But, and yet, it, it, but you have to figure out what that is for you. It, it could be something different. But the one thing I want you to really understand, when I work with people who are working with young people who are academically not being successful and they realize they're bright children, this is going to be a no-brainer. And then they only go from a D to a C, and they walk into our offices like, what did we do wrong? I can't believe that he's not an A student. He's brilliant. Um, the expectation wasn't where he was at, right? But is it any less impactful? He went from a D to a C. He was absent 100 days last year, and now he's absent four, right? And so you're going to have to calibrate a little bit of what does success look like for you and make sure that you are clear, that you can't rescue this person, that even if you had all the contacts in the world and you found them that job, that doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna keep that job, right? And so then the failure and the onus only lies with you. And what you wanna make sure in this relationship, like every relationship, is that they have some responsibility and some stake in that. Does that make sense? So I just, you know, I want you to be realistic about it. Yes, you can potentially be working with the next CEO of a company, or you can be working with someone who's going to be a great worker and just do it well and excel in whatever it is that they're going to do. And are you okay with that, right? And so you gotta get comfortable with sort of that and allow for you to be part of their discovery process for themselves, but not the person that rescues or solves their whole professional sort of yellow brick road, right? So think about what goals you want, because they're coming in armed. They've had 40 minutes of just thinking about this. So you have some good questions to ask of them. They're ready for you. One of the things that I was concerned about is you don't want to walk in and feel like it's going to be an interview. But you want them to be ready to sort of share fun stuff. Let's talk about the NBA finals if they like it, right? and to share a little bit about what do you want out of this relationship? How are we gonna to work together? How often are we talking? Is Monday at 8.30 in the morning good, you know? Or is it Friday 
at six. I don't know. Um, if you discover you like ice cream, maybe it's over ice cream every other week. I don't know. <laughs> but make sure that that's sort of the driver and the connector to the work that you're going to be doing. Okay? And within that, I promise, all that experience and expertise you have is going to be flooding all over the place. Okay? Fair enough? Okay. So I think, am I on time? Yes, you are. I have really like... Q&A, go for it. I've got five minutes. <laughs> this is a condensed, almost six hour painting for you, so it's super condensed. Six hours in one hour. <laughs> yes. Right. Shabir, he, he made a very good point in terms of uh, what are their expectations, you know, when, I mean, because it would be super helpful to understand their agenda, you know. I was reading this profile, I'm in love with this lady because I've been in the Himalayas, he's in the, con in, in the education field, so I'm already in love, but my point is, it would be great to know more about their agenda and the role that they expect us to play. You know, because we can be, I can be there, you know, can play the grandpa role, like, oh, I've mm -hmm. been there. Uh, or, but I think that you need to make your own mistakes, you know, you need to, uh, so my point is, you, that, you have the experience, what's the role that you suggest us to play here? I really think that you have to become the guider, the supporter, the cheerleader, and not the resolver. So you love her profile, get to know her more. Get to know, you know what makes her click. Talk about the work. Talk about the work they're doing. Talk about their aspirations. Are they getting closer to that? What are the barriers to that, right? Because there are some universal things that happen for individuals, fear. Right? It, it could be the paralyzing factor of moving forward. How do you sort of navigate? What does fear look like for that person? It might be that they kind of ran through things, or it might be that they get completely paralyzed. So this is about sort of figuring out where do they want to be and you guiding them through the process. Because like they said, if they come equipped with a job already, they're really looking for someone to help them design their motion forward. And there are two things that you can do in life. There's the active participation piece of talking, but it's also what I'm doing with Anna right now. I'll figure out at the end of the summer if it worked out. Hey Anna, there's this great event and you have this opportunity to be around the table and see me do my work. She might come out of here and say, I never want to train in my life. Never want to do that. Is that horrible for me? Probably. Is it great for her? Sure. <laughs> I helped in that discovery process, right? So I would say it's not about telling folks what to do, it's helping them along the journey of their career, right? And that's a huge thing, so let's pare it back. Get to know that person. If you like her on paper, I bet you you'll like her in person. Like her. One of the things that you mentioned is that uh, in terms of the younger people, it's like when I look at this profile, it's probably <laughs> it's <been> impressive. <laughs> Like, in your case, it's not that young. Yeah. No, it's kind of the opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, is people, that no, it's not. It's not common. that. It, it it is common. You know, I've had some of my best mentors come later in my life. My you know, my dearest mentor is eighty years old. I met her when I was you know, twenty two, starting no, my like career. The, I think she's older than me. <laughs> it's okay. That's I mentor okay. my mentor all the time. <laughs> you can ask yeah. her. Like. Um, and you know what? Sometimes it's about having a thinking partner in life. Okay. So one of the things that I really value sometimes is when people pick up the phone and go, you know, I just need someone that I trust to think, help me think this through. I'm about to do X, Y, Z. And this is what I'm worried about. Okay. And if you know me, you know that you're going to say, are you going to do that? <laughs> or are you going to say, I think that's right for you. Why are you afraid? Go for it. Right? So I wouldn't be intimidated um, with the shift. Um, I actually find people further along in their career, much older, saying, I never had a mentor. I need to find one. And they're actually looking for younger folks who are more technologically inclined, who are sort of in the know, because they think they're out of the know, and what they realize is that they're a lot more in the know than they know. So, you'll be okay. <laughs> now this is about fit and chemistry, and you'll figure that out. Well, how were these people selected, or where they come from, and, and 
did we leave people outside of this program because of a lack of mentee, mentors? Or I mean, it's a question for you probably. Not that we did in house. I selected the mentors, so that's why I knew <laughs> <laughs> that, but I'll tell you later. Yeah. Um, and yes, we have uh, many mentees that, um, following her just suggestion, she recommended us to have a program with between 15 to 20 mentors, no more than that, so we could handle it. So we have 17 mentors here and 10 mentors in Washington. So yes, we have many mentees that do not have a mentor right now. So do they, how do they learn about this program? They sign up and are they? We send it to our entire database, information about the mentoring program. We send it to the DOL visa holders and we send it to the MBA wow. students that we have. So this is a program that could go on for <laughs> Yeah, decades. I mean, this is the first right? time because we do it. A lot of this is six you months, and then we continue. In the city, you go to Evanston Young right now, or anywhere that's doing mentoring programs, they have something called a waiting list. And when you think about, you know, across the United States, if you look at the demographics, at least half of, you know, 13 million children still need and want a mentor or some type of adult figure in their life. And um, if you look in your folders in the mentoring um, effects study that we did, you'll discover that most people went through most of their life without a mentor. And so the, er, the, the need and the, and the desire to have one as an adult is just as palpable many times. You can have more than one at the same time if you want. No, no, you cannot. <laughs> It's advisable to have only one. It is advisable to have one at a time. No, no, <laughs> because I said, you know, I, I, you know, I'm... He requested uh, two, in fact. No, I just said I'm happy with two because in practice I have, oh, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I have <laughs> lawyers coming by, you know, <laughs> just all yeah. the time. So I do this with you know, all the time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the more than 60,000 kids around the city that don't have a mentor and they're looking for people who are in your companies. We have direct research that shows that staff who is in a company committed to mentoring young people have greater morale in the workforce and also have greater loyalty to their companies. And there's direct research for that, so I can share that with you <laughs> as well. So please stay in touch with us. You will see us with some level of frequency. You have our support through the next six months. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much.